all no, 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 no. We're doing this right no, now. No, we no. We're hang taking on, a hang time on. No, no, out. Hang on yes. a second. No. We are taking a time out and we're talking about Scooby Doo. Yes, here it is once again, 32 Thoughts, the podcast, presented as always by the GMC Sierra, Merrick Friedman and Dom Shramati along with you a little bit later. He is one of the most focused individuals you will find anywhere in the NHL. He is Nathan McKinnon. Elliot sat down with him on Friday, one day in advance of the Avalanche, beating the Toronto Maple Leafs. And Elliot beating the Toronto Maple Leafs was kind of a theme this weekend around the NHL and maybe on Sunday from one of the more unlikeliest foes Planes, trains, automobiles, snowstorms. The Detroit Red Wings still got through. The game was delayed a little bit, almost a full hour. But at the end, it was Red Wings 4 with an empty netter. Maple Leafs 2 in a game that I think a lot of elite teams would look at and say, this is a game we need to get on the wings early, foot on the throat, and not let up. That was a disappointing defeat. And we one of the things we were talking about... Uh, before the game, Jeff, in our 52-minute pregame. And let's face nice it. Nice Nice Let's face dads. it. The real winners were the audience who got to listen to Dave and Justin, Nick, and myself talk for an extra 22 minutes. Please. That is le- worth its weight in gold. That quality television. Anyway, uh, one of the things that remind me of, remember a couple of years ago when, when Victor Hedman... Uh, they had that game, Tampa, L.A., and, and and Tampa was short guys, and Hedman knew he was going to play 40 minutes or something. And John Cooper said that Hedman was so excited to play the game that night because they knew they had every excuse to lose, but Hedman was challenging himself to see if they could win it. It was, it was a personal challenge for Hedman. I, I just remembered that, and I thought about Detroit. They're walking in. They really looked, sorry guys, disheveled. They looked like they'd been sitting on a plane for eight hours. You're calling someone disheveled. I know, that is true. Oh, uh... Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it's pure pot calling the kettle black. Like it's, the kettle is on line two, Mr. Pot. It's, it's embarrassing. There's no question. Like I, I am okay. completely shameless, and I have no morals. Yes, they look disheveled. They were sitting on a plane all day. You know, I kind of wondered if, you know, would, would Iserman make them sit there all day in suits and ties? And the answer was no. Uh, they walked in, they were tired. And, but, you know, you wonder, are they going to take this as a challenge? We have every excuse to lose. Nobody's going to think we can win this game. And the way they celebrated at the end of the game, Jeff, the answer oh, was, the bench. was obviously yes. Obviously yes. But you're right. Toronto should have pounded them early uh, for the travel reasons and also. Samsonov's first game, um, you know, you've got to protect your goalie. And that, to me, was the, was the biggest loss for Toronto in, in the game. He made a huge save when it was still 2-2 a minute before uh, uh, Cop scored the winner. Samsonov gave you a game where you could have won. And you need that for him and you need that for yourselves. That's, that's a bad loss for Toronto. And Detroit is right there. Right there now, they're back in the race. They're they're right with them, and, and that's the one thing about Toronto. Like it, it was a bad week. It's been a bad stretch. They've let some teams off the mat here, and again, that takes us back to a debate that we had on the Maple Leafs earlier in the season, which is, should this team really be buying? Like, is this the year to buy? And they wanted Nylander done, and they got it done because they wanted to know that that bit of business was over. But still, still, they have to be asking themselves, with the limited amount of stuff that we have to trade, is this really the year to buy? And I would be asking that question again this weekend. What's the old saying? Managers will always tell you, teams make the decision whether we're buyers or not. Uh, there was that one year in Toronto when uh, David Ayers came in for the Carolina Hurricanes, which pretty much made up Kyle Dubas's mind. That's right. The next uh, meeting, deal, he was deals. supposed to trade for Zach Bogosian, basically. And, and that's he right. said, "There were deals, deals on the table that went said, away." Based Screw on it. That game. I'm not doing that. Yep. yep. I'm not. Uh, I'm not rewarding this. So th- I think that's a really interesting one. Uh, I think for Maple Leafs fans, I- I've been saying, and we've been talking about it all year. Don't be surprised. 
if the Toronto Maple Leafs come trade deadline time, don't do anything. Or if they do anything, it's not much, unlike other teams that are um, going to compete for the Stanley Cup. Because on Saturday, there was bad weather in Buffalo. We all know the story. They moved I the NFL there. playoff game. <laughs> That's right. You were there. You know, yeah. Brad Tree Living made a trip on Saturday afternoon to go see the Sabres and the Canucks. And, and I and I think one of the things we're all kind of sitting there saying, you know, the, he doesn't see Vancouver a lot. He probably hasn't seen Buffalo a ton. Um, but everybody was kind of wondering with the weather the way it was and the team playing that night, it's pretty interesting that he went down there to, to make that trip. And, you know, there's some there's some interesting names you could look at in those situations and say, you know, what's uh, what's he up to here? But to, to be up 3 nothing on Colorado and then – to have that team in 2-2 with a couple minutes left and not come out with it with a point, it's a really rough outcome. Really rough outcome. Especially since uh, Sheldon Keefe tried the mini Darko. He didn't go for the $25,000 <laughs> fine, and he didn't have yeah. the crazy eyes that the Raptors head coach had. But he mm. did complain about the one call and get three first-period power plays about it. So but the, uh, tough the, night. Uh, the, tough the Austin night. Matthews call on Saturday night that you're referring to. Yep. yep. Yeah. And then uh, was rewarded early uh, in that game against the Detroit Red Wings. Well, the good thing for the Toronto Maple Leafs, Elliot, is that uh, as they go out on this road trip, their schedule is going to be easy. Checks notes, Edmonton, oops, they've won 10 in a row. The Calgary Flames, the Vancouver Canucks, <laughs> and then the Seattle Kraken, who at the time of this recording have won nine games in a row. And Happy we, road trip, Toronto. Yes, and, you know, obviously huge win for the Red Wings. And Patrick Kane, he left in the first period. Tough shift where he took a big hit from Holmberg and then fell, making a good defensive play on Holmberg. What a great scoring chance. But the, the initial word is it's not the hip. I think we all worried when we saw that that it was – a, a hip injury and Derek Lalone said post game that, it, that he didn't think it was the hip. And I'd heard the same thing reported during game. We'll wait for further clarity, but the word is it was not the hip. I'll say this. If there's one injury, everybody's winning on right now. It's Jack Eichel. Um, that's, that's the one uh, he, he, he got hurt against Boston on Thursday. He came back, he scored, and everybody thought this was no big deal. And I guess it the soreness just didn't go away on Friday. And I, and I heard there was some inflammation there. And they're doing some tests. And I was told, you know, we're going to have to wait a few days to figure out what this is. And I, I don't like to jump to conclusions. But um, put it this way, there there's some people waiting. Okay, what exactly do we have here? And until we know it's not that bad... People are nervous. I, I guess that's the best way to put it. I don't like to overstate anything I don't know, but I think nervous is the right word. Until you know for sure this isn't a bad thing, people are nervous. And getting called up because of this injury, Brendan Brisson yes. from the Henderson Silver Knights of the AHL and in the process turns Pat Brisson from agent to nervous Anxious hockey dad, as we uh, stand by to see how how Brisson does with this uh, with this call up. That's a that, that that's a great one for that family, certainly. Yep. Um, you talked about Eichel on Saturday. A couple of other things from your uh, from your conversation with uh, Ron McLean on Saturday headlines. Uh, Jacob Markstrom and the no move. Jacob Markstrom and the conversation. What's up with Jacob Markstrom? Well, look, um, you know, Kevin Weeks set Twitter on fire on the weekend, and uh, he did it in a very stylish way. I have to say, if you want to create maximum carnage, just tweeting out a picture of Jacob Markstrom would do that. Um, you know, I think that the, the tough thing for the Flames was that it was on, like, their father's mentor's trip, and, um, you know, and Markstrom was there with his brother, and, you know, they basically told me, we don't want, we don't want to talk about this because... It's, it's a really nice time for us. They've they done really well. They won at home with all the families there. They won in Arizona, and, and they obviously they went and they won with uh, Vegas. So, you know, they were saying to me they didn't want to say anything. 
But, you know, the, the thing that I heard just from talking around is that, number one, as of Saturday night and Sunday when we taped this, I don't think they'd gone to Markstrom with anything. I, I, I just, there's no evidence I could find that there was something there that they'd gone to him with. So that's number one. And number two, what a couple people said to me was, there's an understanding there that they're not just going to him w- with anything. For example, if some team says, you know, we'll trade you Markstrom for a seventh round pick, Calgary's not going to him with that. Um, they're, what I was told and the words I used and I was told was high bar, that it really has to be a great trade or somewhere they really think Markstrom would want to go. And other than that, they're not going to him. And um, because I just don't think Markstrom wants to be bothered by it. And then there's also this, uh, this the Kelly Rudy rule, which is that he believes that no move clause players shouldn't even be asked. And, you know, that's probably as far an ideology that you can get on this. And, you know, and Craig Conroy was a player, and I would assume that he has some recognition that uh, of what it's like to be a player and sort of put into the bad position of being asked to waive a no-move clause. So that's where I think it stands, Jeff, is that I don't think anything's happened so far, and I think the words I was told was high bar to even go to him. So um, I've thought a lot about and I've talked to Kelly about and I've talked to you about it as well. And um, Kelly's been upfront about this from day one, his thoughts on on the no move clause, just so all of our listeners have an understanding. Kelly's point in all of that is because I think a lot of listeners may look at that and say, well, why shouldn't you even be able to ask a player to waive his no trade? Kelly's point is that that is something that's negotiated into a contract. That is something that two sides have agreed upon. Sometimes uh, players will uh, get a no trade in exchange for a lower salary. They'll have that type of security. And I've always looked at Kelly's logic behind that and understood it and agreed with it. Um, to me, it it sounds and feels like you turn a contract into charity, which is give me something in exchange for nothing. You know, we want you to waive your no trade so we can do this bit of business. That player isn't getting anything for agreeing to waive that no trade. Now, if there was, and we'll see what happens in the next round of CBA negotiations, maybe this will get brought up. Maybe it's been brought up before. I still believe if a player has a no trade and you ask that player to waive it and you make a deal that that player should somehow be financially compensated for waiving that no trade clause. That to me is a deal. You waive the no trade, you get this in exchange. We want to do this business with you. You're, this is how you're going to be compensated for it. Well, that happens in the NBA. The NBA has something called a trade kicker. I don't think that this would be allowed in the NHL um, under the current CBA, but the NBA does have a rule. It's called a trade kicker. And, and basically what it is is that a player who has one gets more money if he's dealt to a new team. So, for example, like one of the trade kickers out there, a couple of years ago, uh, Ben Simmons was traded, and he had a 15% trade kicker. So now you can waive it if you really want to, And I don't remember what happened with Simmons, but I do remember in that conversation that that came up. So the NBA does have a rule for that. I don't think you I don't think you could do that in the NHL. Someone will tell me if I'm wrong, but I don't think you can. No, uh, that's that was my point in the next round of CBA negotiations. That's not for this one under this CBA. You can't do it like a contract is a contract. There can be no new money introduced. None of that. But all I'm saying is in the next CBA. If that's something on the PA's radar, I don't know. But further to Kelly Rudy's point, uh, I think that if you're going to, again, this is all philosophical and theoretical, ask a player to waive, and that player agrees they should be compensated if a trade is consummated. That's my only point there. And we'll see what happens with Jacob Markstrom. But you can understand why he's a highly thought of commodity out there. Um, excellent, excellent goaltender. Well, I, I, have, um, I have to tell you, that was uh, that was a great performance by the Flames. That was... Uh... 
They, they had a hell of a week. I wouldn't let the parents go home or the or the mentors go home. Like you're stuck there. You have to stay. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. That was like the um that one uh that one uh, early New York Islanders team. What year was it? Was it seventy five? And they were playing at MSG. Chico Rush told me the story. They were playing at Madison Square Garden, and the circus was there right before the uh, the, the the game against the Rangers. And someone from the circus mistakenly put a bag of elephant dung in the Islanders' room, and they beat the Rangers and decided that their good luck charm was the bag of elephant dung. And Chico said they took it from game to game as their good luck charm against the New York Rangers. Anyhow. Um, I don't know why my brain. I, I gotta there tell you, thank story, God I wasn't on that team. That's not the. <laughs> th- that's not. I, I'd rather. I, I'd rather Who? force the parents and the mentors to stay <laughs> than have yeah. to carry around a bag of elephant poop. That's my yeah. contribution to this conversation. I wonder whose job that would have been to carry the bag of elephant poop around. Wow. Okay. Uh, off that page, onto the Pittsburgh Penguins page. You talked about this Saturday, the future of Jake Gensel of the Pittsburgh Penguins. Well, obviously, there have been a lot of rumors, and, and the fans in Vancouver are, are drooling over the possibility of, of Jake Gensel uh, being a, a, a Canuck. We all know how much Jim Rutherford loves his former Penguins, and Gensel's a really talented guy. The one thing that a few people said to me is that, first of all, I still think there's going to be another conversation between Gensel and the Penguins, at least one. And I would assume it's going to be sometime around or after the All-Star break. But the one thing I really got told here is that the real determining factor is it, it's not even as much the money as it or the contract as it is where are the Penguins going. And if... You know, they, they've put themselves back in the playoff race. They really looked ugly early in the year. Uh, Crosby is all world. He's he's very much in the Hart Trophy conversation. And as we put this podcast to bed, they are in the race. And, and I just think that's where it's going to come down to. Where is this team going over the next couple of years? Because what they're talking about here is you know, if they really think they're going to have to go through a kind of mini rebuild here, what is that going to mean for players like Gensel? Does it make more sense for them to move a Gensel than keep him? And the other thing that becomes a factor is if you want to keep guys like Gensel, they are going to want you to add. And I think one of the questions the Penguins are asking themselves right now is, does it really make sense for us to add? They don't have a ton of cap room to just go out and throw money at people. So you're going to have to trade for people. And does it make sense for them to be giving up? Like we just talked about Toronto. Is this the year you're chasing for Toronto? They've got to be asking themselves that question. But I think the other thing for Pittsburgh is the same thing. They don't have a ton of assets. Does it make sense for them to be throwing some of those assets away or trading some of those assets for something that helps you win this year or next year? And I think they're asking themselves that very question right now, does it really make sense? So to me, the question is not about Gensel's contract. It's about A, do they think that's the thing that makes the most sense for them? Or B, does Gensel want to be there if, you know, Pittsburgh's going to say, hold on, we're not making short-term moves to make ourselves better. Now, Penguins fans are going to hear this and they're going to think, what does Latang think? What does Malkin think? What does Crosby think? And I think those are all very fair questions. Uh, I just think in the, the fir- it's like the Nylander thing. You deal with what's first on the calendar. And the first thing that's on the calendar is Gensel and I really do believe, after researching it last weekend, the direction of the franchise is is the biggest determining factor in Gensel's future there. Okay, while you were talking, and it wasn't that I was ignoring you. No, you. I, I know you zone out, but it's okay, because I do talk for a long time. I found the poop story. <laughs> oh, my God. So it I was, was I was shoveling the bleep, and you were looking <laughs> for it. It was 75, and in the opening round of the playoffs, the Islanders beat the Rangers. And at MSG, 
They were sharing the facility with Barnum and Bailey, and there were bags of elephant dung around. And they went down in the next series. Now, they ended up beating the New York Rangers, and the bag of dung became sort of, I guess, uh, a lucky charm for the New York Islanders. So they ditched that. They're playing the Penguins in the next round. They go down three games to love. Yep. If you'll remember, Elliot, they were the second was team ever deal. to do it. Bingo. Yeah, exactly. They're yep. the second team to ever, ever go down to, uh, uh, to go down three, nothing and win the first one uh, were the Maple Leafs who beat the Detroit Red Wings. Ironically, 1942 enough, considering our first conversation yep. in 1942. So they needed a spark and they decided that they needed to go get a bag of of elephant poop from Barnum and Bailey, which was their good luck charm against the Rangers. So it was an equipment manager that uh, uh, made the trip uh, with the elephant poo to Pittsburgh, which became the good luck charm for the Islanders. And they ended up defeating the Pittsburgh Penguins one nothing in game seven to come, become the second team of all time to go down three Cobb and then win. Sorry, um, you were saying something about the And, and then you Penguins remember what happened Cancel. the next round in the semifinal. <laughs> Uh, they would have lost to the Flyers. Yes, but they were down. Ended up winning the Stanley Cup. They were down three nothing in that series, and I think it was Al oh. Arbor who joked, "We've got them right where we want them," and they won three in a row. <laughs> they forced it to Game Seven, and they lost Game Seven at the Spectrum, four to yeah. one. So then the Flyers. I-, I believe at that time, the Islanders set a record. Uh, I think they won. I think nine or 10 games facing elimination, something like that. Mm-hmm. And they, maybe it, was, I don't know, it would have to be uh, maybe eight. I don't know, somewhere. But at the time, they set a record for most consecutive games winning when facing elimination. But I remember they were down 3 nothing in the next round, forced game seven, and lost to Philly. Speaking of the Islanders, uh, we saw one of the weirdest visuals we've ever seen on Saturday uh, in Nashville against the Predators when after... Uh, after the Nashville Predators scored the empty net goal to make it three to one, Yusuf Arsenin with the empty netter on that one. I guess everybody thought the game was over. Yes, <laughs> everybody bailed. So, so Thomas Hickey was the guy who kind of explained it a bit because initially when it happened, I, I was like, "Are are these guys like protesting? Are they on strike somehow?" <laughs> you know, I kind of laughed and I said. Are they protesting the stick makers because Mayfield's stick broke, allowing the game-winning goal to beat Sorokin with seven mm. seconds left? So I didn't know if it was some kind of work to rule or something like that. Just a, a horrible way to lose, although I give credit to the Predators' Twitter account who tweeted at me, or a wonderful way to win, something like yeah. that. Um, but I, I wondered if something happened that the Islanders just said, you know what, we're, we're furious and we're leaving. And the thing that kind of made me realize that it probably wasn't the case is I don't think the coach would do that. Like Lane Lambert is not storming off the bench, uh, you know, with with time remaining uh, because he's mad about something and the whole team's following him. And someone later on, you know, someone sent me uh, uh, the video. If you look at it, when the puck goes in, it says zero on the the TV screen, so the clock and the had horn to goes be, off. And, yeah, and the, the horn, horn goes, goes off. off. So the clock had to be right there too. They thought the game was over. Now, why only six guys stayed? Maybe the linesman got them, or the referee got them, or they realized they were dropping the puck. I'm not really sure, but yeah. you know, Thomas Hickey did make a good explanation for it because for the first time I saw it. Jeff, I was like, boy, the Islanders must be furious. And then I started to say, <laughs> what would Lou Lamorello think about this? Like, is he going to be happy with his team doing a work to rule with one second left in regulation? But unfortunately, the story was nowhere near that good, and they simply thought the game was over. You know, Bo Horvat stayed on the bench, too, and the cutaway to Horvat, he has, like, one of the weirdest looks and expressions that we've seen from Bo Horvat. And I like, I'll get to write this one down because uh, the next time we interview Horvat, I'm just curious to see like, what's going through your head at that moment. You look over to your bench, it's empty. Uh, you got Lee Pellick, Dobson, Fashing, and Nelson uh, on the ice, but everybody's gone. <laughs> I'm just curious, like what's happening in between the ears of Bo Horvat? Uh, at that moment. Nonetheless, it's weird because everyone in Nashville is standing up on their bench and you look over the Islanders and 
It is the bench that hockey players forgot at that moment. In the NFL, you used to have to do that. If you scored a touchdown with no time left, you had to kick the extra point. It was part of the rule. And about five years ago, they they changed the rule. And what, one of the things that changed it was my Vikings, one of the few times they didn't break my heart. Like, the, it was tough weekend for some football fans, like those Cowboy fans. It was brutal weekend. Uh, great weekend for the Lions fans. Haven't said that a lot, but great weekend for the Lions fans. But in 2018... Uh, Minnesota won a miracle playoff game against New Orleans. And, you know, with no time left, they scored a miracle touchdown to win. And they didn't break our hearts for a change. And uh, they made the Saints come back on the field for the extra point. Could you imagine? Like, oh, you're in your room. <laughs> you're despondent. Yeah. You've given up the most come ridiculous. Come on out here. Like, the Saints deserve yeah. to win that game. And they lost on a fluke touchdown. Oh, by the way, you got to come back out so we can kick the extra point. It's yeah. just, I would have told them to get lost. I, I don't care how much they would have fined me. Salt on an open wound. Yes. You know, most of my friends, I'm not much of an NFL uh, follower, as, as you can tell. Um, but all my buddies are all Pittsburgh Steelers fans. And so they're on pins and needles and they've got one extra day now. Uh, to worry and fret because the Bills game has been been pushed to Monday because of the major snowstorm. So um, that's about the extent. I follow the NFL through my friends who are all Pittsburgh Steelers fans. Meanwhile, Ottawa looking for Hate veterans. Jeff, Bills in- fans. Hate Jeff. <laughs> uh, Ottawa Senators looking for veterans gauging the market on younger players. Alex? Well, I, I think they have a, a quite a few untouchables, and I think those guys are obvious. Like Chikrin's name uh, came out uh, last week. And uh, like I don't, I don't think they're rushing to do anything like that. I, I, I really don't. I do think one thing they're figuring out is who teams like, and I, it doesn't. You know, they're a new front office. Um, Steos has been there for a few months. Uh, Bonus has been there for a little bit longer. Dave Poulin just got there. You know, I, I was talking to one of the uh, one of the managers the other day of another team, and he says one of the first things you do when you get in there is, you know, the person you replace, some of them are really good. They'll leave you detailed stuff and others don't. And now I don't know which way that went in Ottawa, but even if you're left detailed notes, you've got to find out for yourself, right? Is this still true? Did this change? And 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 he thinks that's one of the reasons of like a, like things like names like Chikrin's getting out there, whether it's true or not, it's because, you know, everyone wants to find out you know what? You know what is Ottawa thinking of doing? Because look, when when a team comes out and says, "Look, we want to do something," like Ottawa basically has, these guys they're like sharks, right? Oh, there's a there's there's a a, a a millimeter of blood in the Atlantic Ocean. Let's all go for it. Like that's that's the way these guys are, and so they're asking, "What are you thinking?" And look, like I don't think Kachuk's getting traded. I don't think Stutzla's getting traded. I don't think. Uh, Sanderson's getting traded and I've been a real moron by suggesting any of these names because now people are going to be like, Oh, Elliot didn't say X name. So there could be traded. No, I, I, I think they've got a lot f- quite a few untouchables here, but I think they want to Fre- know. Elliot Fried, Elliot Friedman says Drake Batherson's getting traded. <laughs> That's Holy right. Smokes. He left, he left them out of his list. I think they, I think they want to know like who's, what do people think of our players? And, and that's what I think. Otto was doing. I mean, we're going to hear a lot of crazy rumors with Vancouver. I, I think that's going to, just because they've got such a passionate fan base and they're so aggressive and they're out there on social media, I, I think Vancouver is going to be the rumor center of, of the NHL over the next little while. Like, obviously, I think there's a lot of circumstantial evidence that makes sense on the Gensel. Uh, Erickson act this weekend. I, I don't buy that one. I, I I don't see any any reason why Minnesota would do that. Um, you know, I it, w- it would really surprise me. But I, I just think you're going to start hearing a lot of stuff about the Canucks. I and obviously the Wild. The Wild are going to have some big decisions they're going to have to make. You know, the the coach bounce. It's not there. That was an awful awful loss. Like the only thing I was boot mad off about, the ice. You know, Elliot, you know, boot off the ice. And we've seen that a few times this year. The only thing I didn't like about that from Arizona's point of view is that 
the Wild shouldn't be allowed to lose that bad in those uniforms. Those are beautiful uniforms, and if they say we have to put them away because we lost six nothing to Arizona, that is a that is a capital crime by the by the Coyotes to to make Minnesota put those uniforms away. Um, what but, they should have done, what they should have done, is call the timeout, and everyone and had changed. to go and change. <laughs> That's right. You have to <laughs> we wear cannot lose this badly. That, that Clayton <laughs> Keller goal, what a beautiful goal! And uh, a hockey player, uh, what a great that hockey Keller, player he fantastic. Is. But um, I, uh, I, I look at uh, Minnesota, like Minnesota doesn't have, does not have a lot to trade, and. You know, it's been a hard year there. Some of the recent stories, the investigations, um, and injuries, injuries, um, and you know, you know what? What someone said to me, and they made a really good point, is that whenever you go through what the Wild went through with investigations, you always wonder. Okay, you go through the initial investigation, and then you know people start looking around. What else comes? What's the aftermath? And I don't know that I'm expecting anything, to be perfectly honest. Um, but you you're really on edge, and you know the it's it. And when you're losing, like they're starting to lose now, like I I could just see Minnesota being like we we just have to uh, like I don't know get to the end of the season, whatever, and just take stock on everything that's happened um, because. Your your organization is just shell shocked when you're going through times like this, and and I think that's exactly what the Wild are going through right now. The Kings are different, Jeff. The Kings, it's just hockey, um, and you know, eight losses in a row. They have to figure out simply how to win games, and it's obviously you know Edmonton has caught them now, and that's that's a big concern. Seattle is is coming back right at them. Calgary is coming back right at them. It's a big concern. But I think it's different when it's just hockey as opposed to, you know, some of the off ice stuff the Wild have had to deal with. Elliot, I know we've used up a lot of oxygen this year in our lives talking about the Philadelphia Flyers. That was a really emotional week for the Philadelphia Flyers. Mm-hmm. Um, is it going to be calm for a while for the Philadelphia Flyers, or will there be minor eruptions? Uh, volcanic I'm sure they eruptions? hope it's going to be a lot quieter. <laughs> Look, they had a, they had a great weekend. They they beat the Jets. Yes. Um, and the good news for the Jets is not too bad on Shifley, and it looks like Kyle Connor's getting Thank close. So the, the rich get richer there. Um, but, you know, they, they had the win over the Wild on Friday night too. And, and by the way, uh, I, I could not believe the Wild didn't get a penalty shot in overtime. Like right before the winning goal, that was that was, that was was crazy. Ooh, I know Keith not, was mad on Saturday, yeah. but that one was <laughs> even more egregious on Friday. But look, like you know, Drysdale didn't play on Saturday sick, but he he looked really good for them early, and you yep. know Philly Philly got a bit of a jolt, a positive one, um, uh, with with Drysdale's arrival. The one thing I wonder there is, I, I really wonder if they they try to get Sealer done. Um, you know, they they kind of have to figure out where they're going here. You know, Drysdale adds another body. They they and I do think that they would like to start figuring out where they're going long term here but to me the guy I think they they really try to get done uh, and no insult to anybody else but I I think sealer um, I, I, that's the one I that's the one a couple teams told me um, and again I don't want anyone to turn this into what does that mean for Walker I because I don't know but I had some teams say, indicate to me they think mm-hmm. Philly is trying to get at least sealer done. Although I think a lot of people look at that and say, of course they're looking to extend the left hand shot D. Uh, yeah, there's a you know that right hand shot as you mentioned in Sean Walker on the expiring contract. They just bring in another right hand shot defenseman in Jamie Drysdale. Rasmus Ristolainen, and right shot defenseman is sitting there as well. Someone's drawing. Sandheim can play both sides. Here. Yeah. So we'll 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 see what happens, but that doesn't surprise me about Sealer. Like, look, we all know what Philadelphia wants to build and the kind of players they want to build around. Sealer fits that identity very much. Thought on Drew Doughty responding to a trade proposal. So, so, so somebody <laughs> somebody sent me this, and uh, it, it's crazy stuff. Like fans are fans; they're discussing trades. What can we do? And you know, the the Kings fans they want to see Spence and Clark in the same game, which the Kings have. Sure 
decided to avoid. And I, I really like both those young players. And I guess there's some tweeter who said, well, we'll probably have to trade Matt Roy, who's been our best defenseman for the last five years. And Drew Doughty, who uh, hasn't tweeted in about five years, tweeted <laughs> ha at this. And what that says to me is that Drew Doughty in Carolina on Monday is going to have a monster night. Mm. So Drew Doughty, by the way, prior to that, hadn't tweeted since June 2022. And it was about F1. <laughs> <laughs> that's right um I, I do i can't let something go here i do have to remark on it the person who made that tweet that Doughty responded to yeah at marcel and rogi like come on that's a great twitter handle do you think it's at a marcel person who's and half rogi? marcel dion half rogi vashon that would be the perfect hockey player that would be they the could play the game by themselves. Right Hall of Fame scorer, two Hall of, of Fame my, goalie. Two of my all-time favorite players in the history of the sport, Marcel Dion and Rogi Vashon, going away. West Coast Hockey Bias at Marcel and Rogi. Great, great handle right there. I got to tell you, like that tweet is a window into the soul of <laughs> Drew Doughty and the Kings right now. Okay, Doctor Freud. Well, no, 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 because I, I always, <laughs> get, I try to put myself, on, on the, I try to put myself in people's shoes. I got Freud's book <laughs> on the bookshelf. I'm looking at it right now. I, because I always try to put myself in people's shoes, and it's going really badly for the Kings right now. And if if they go out and they have a big night and they beat the Hurricanes on Monday night, you're gonna know that. Look, Drew Day doesn't need any more motivation. He's got a lot of pride. They're struggling. He wants to get a win. But yeah. you always have to dig a little bit deeper. And Drew Doughty is going to be digging a little bit deeper because some rando on social media said that Matt Roy is the best defenseman on the Kings for the last five years. <laughs> you know, I respect you know, it. I, I, you, you I respect it. it. I, you know, I, I get a lot of people who take shots at me too. And that's life in the big city. I think if you're going to do these jobs, that's the way it is. But I, and I really have a thick skin and I don't really pay attention to a lot of it, but I admit there have been times where where someone said something about me and I'm like, oh yeah? Like just a random person on Twitter, a bot with nine numbers at the end of their <laughs> name, an OnlyFans model. It's it's all oh. happened. I've had people oh. do, do shots like that and I just say, oh yeah? And it's stupid. It's really stupid. I cannot deny it's stupid, but... Once in a while, we do need to dig a little bit more out of ourselves. So, when someone sent me that, I, I just laughed. I, I, I just you know what I find funny. You know what I find, Elliot? When things are going poorly for you, either personally or professionally, yeah, it's a really good time to spend a lot of your hours on Twitter. <laughs> yeah. Real, know. real smart. Things are going awful. I'm gonna go on Twitter right now. <laughs> Drew Doughty, what are you doing? Um, I think I think it, I think it's like uh, you know I think as you know the media we love Doughty we love Doughty. Are you and kidding? For sure. This is another gold. chapter in the legend that is Drew Doughty. I, I really I really want to see him have a monster of a game on Monday night, like just a monster of a game. If you're producing that Kings Carolina game for Los Angeles. That Drew Doughty response is what you open up with. <laughs> Depends on how good your relationship is with them. Then you wait until it's always tougher <laughs> on the team broadcasters. It really is. They have true. to they have to walk a tighter line than we do. That is true. Okay, uh, I want to fly through a couple of things here. Um, yeah. Any update on Corey Perry in that situation? No, I I, I don't think so. I I hadn't heard much today. I think I, I think people just want to be as quiet as they possibly can on it. Okay, um, Edmonton 10 straight wins, courtesy of Evan Bouchard. Yeah, Edmonton-Toronto on Tuesday night. Uh, 
games that you know the only thing that bothers me about Edmonton Toronto on the Tuesday night is that it's a re- it's it's a regional game. McDavid Matthews should never be regional games. Never. Um, it's the only thing I don't like about it. the The entire audience should be able to watch these games, but they look they look fantastic. And and and, and again, I think they think they're a little bit thin, the Oilers. And but before they kind of dialed it back, it's like we talked about Toronto. Now I think they're looking around again. Cody Hodgson comeback. Yeah. That made me smile on Saturday, Elliot. I was surprised at how much reaction it got, but maybe... Uh, I, People I, love them. Yeah, maybe I should People love them. Um, People loved Cody Hodgson. Look, I did. Cody Hodgson, first round pick, played 325 games, retired at 26. Um, you know, admitted later he had a condition. And it, it's a condition that's different for different people. Um, and... Uh, you know, for him, it caused him some real serious muscle injuries, tears and things like that. And he talked about it later. He had to retire. And, um, you know, I heard someone sent me a note. And I don't know if this person would want me to say who it was. Um, but it was a former player who skates with him. You know, he sent me a note saying, you know, I skate with Cody Hodgson. And, and he looks great. And I think he wants to play. So I, I reached out to him. And uh, he told me it's true. He's skating five, six times a week. He's, you know, he's doing some work with Yari, the skills coach. Yari Bursky, no yeah, way. Is yeah, he with Bursky? Yeah, he's doing oh, some work I didn't know with that. Yari Bursky, and, he, and he's skating, and huh. he's working out five, six days a week. He said he got kind of a clean bill of health in the summer. And, oh, wow. you know, I, I, like anybody who's, like anybody who would have to retire that way, you're unfulfilled, right? It's one of the things I tell a lot of young students. I say, look, like I can't tell you what to do, but I can tell you from personal experience what you don't want to do and the way I kind of live my life. And that was when I turned 50, I promised myself that I was never going to look in the mirror and say, I really regret I didn't give it my all at that because that's something I really wanted to do. And we all have things we don't do it to the fullest, but there's the things we we're going to look back and we're going to say, I I'm going to regret that I didn't do that. And you know, for the most mm. part, I live my life like that. When I hit 50 and I'm now 53, there weren't many things I looked at and said, man, I, I, I really regret that. And I always tell people, ask yourself that question. Am I going to regret not doing this when I'm 50? And you know, so Hodgson's going to be 34 next month. His birthday's in February. And I get it. He's probably looking at it and saying, boy, I'm going to regret the way it ended. And, and the thing he said to me is, look, I know I'm not going to the NHL. I I know that I'm not going to be guaranteed anything. I just want to play. I, I, I want to play somewhere. And to be honest, I was thinking about the Newfoundland Growlers after. Uh, <laughs> Terry Ryan. <laughs> after, after the Terry Ryan thing. Um, but. Uh, he just wants a chance to play. Like, just get back in, take a run at it, and I and I hope he gets this opportunity. Let's. Uh, and and I'm with you. Uh, I wish him all the best. I think a lot of people are cheering for Cody Hodgson. Um, let's finish with Terry Ryan then. 47 years old. Um, plays on Sunday for the Newfoundland Growlers against Adirondack team they're chasing in the North. Uh, it's a six-two loss. Um, uh, in the process, Terry Ryan fight Zach Walker. <laughs> uh, I, I didn't uh, see who the first guy was, but the guy who basically threw up his hands and said, it's not going to be me. I, I thought yeah. that was hilarious. <laughs> that was pretty good. Um, Terry Ryan, who, I mean, you know, Terry, I've known TR for years, larger than life personality, uh, loves everyone that he's around, just has like the heart of a Newfoundlander, just big, huge, you know, a uh, hug for everybody. Your thoughts on, on Terry Ryan getting the call, Terry Ryan getting in the game. Well, I think this is Paul Bissonnette's story to tell, and I'm sure he'll tell it on on Spit and Chicklets this week. But Paul was the one who heard about this like on Saturday night. He was sitting around with us when he got the call that Ryan was going to play, and when he was telling us, we were looking at him and we thought he was joking. Paul is is so hilarious that you, you don't know at the beginning like is is he being serious or is is this a joke? But you know, it, as 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 Ryan said himself, they called him while he was out celebrating his birthday, and you know, basically he asked them, "If you're serious about this, I'll, I'll go back home and I'll stop drinking now." And they said, "Yeah, we're we're really short, 
um, we, we're actually going to need you. You know, first of all, it's hard to get players to go out to Newfoundland. And secondly, I, I didn't realize this, but I guess there's a rule in the ECHL that if a player leaves you after, I think it's January 10th, you can't bring them back. So, so I, I guess they, they must have lost some players. Like, it's different if it's a call-up, and the Marlies have had a bunch of call-ups, so they're short players. But if, yeah. if a player leaves you to go play somewhere else, I guess you can't bring them back. So they were stuck, and I guess one of his teammates called first, and then Adam Party called, and they got it all sorted out. But this was incredible promotion for the ECHL. Like, I know there's going to be people who are going to look at this and they're going to say, really? Like, this is the story we need? A 47-year-old guy being pulled out of a bar to come back? Pfft. I don't have time for people like that. I'm looking at Ken Reed. Uh, Ken Reed, like, watching the game, is tweeting out him watching the game <laughs> on his computer because he's so interested. I'm just glad that Ken Reed didn't show us his tabs. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, literally afraid to know what's on <laughs> Ken Reed's tabs. But, you know, I mean, it, it was great. I thought it was really fun. You? Uh, listen, I've got a soft spot in my heart for Terry Ryan. Going, I met Terry, geez, 2007, 2008. We've always kept in touch. Uh, sometimes we've been able to, to cross paths and, and get together other times. Uh, we haven't just, you know, he's one place I'm in another place. Hey buddy, we'll have to catch up with you next time. Um, I, first of all, I, I, I have a ton of respect for someone who, like you can tell TR loves, he hockey loves hockey still loves to hockey. this day, like 47 years old. And I don't know if you saw his post game, like he's yes. really emotional about yes. this. Like he is really emotional about this. He has, you know, he's from a hockey family. His dad played professionally. His dad played for the Minnesota Fighting Saints. His father has this legendary basement um, at the at the Ryan household where it's like a hockey hall of fame, and there's great memorabilia from you know the NHL and the WHA. And I've talked to Senior a number of times. There is no short conversation with Terry Ryan Sr. And that's what I love about it. Like if you're calling TR's dad, park an hour because you're going to get a million great stories. So I have a lot of time for the family and I have a lot of time for someone like Terry himself who, you know, when he started the weekend, you know, like he, he started the weekend just thinking it's going to be another regular ordinary weekend. I'm going to have my birthday and I'm going to have a couple of drinks with my friends. And at the end of it, he played a pro hockey game. Listen, life can be so great. Yeah. Life can be so special. Just when you think, when's the last time he played a pro game? 20 years ago? And he's a big ball hockey player too. Like he loves everything about hockey. He loves the game. He loves the room. He loves to talk. And that's the family too. Like that comes right from dad. So listen, I'm a hockey dad too. And part of me is, you know, watching Terry play in that game against Adirondack on Sunday. And I'm thinking... If I'm senior, how much am I loving watching this? Just when you think you're never going to watch your kid play hockey again, this happens. So I'm with you. It's just too much of a good story to be cynical about or to be all bundled up about. Like, this is a beautiful story for a really beautiful hockey person. Just enjoy it. Yeah. I'm really happy. I'm really, really happy for Terry Ryan. I'm really I, happy for TR. I, I have to tell you too. I, I'm really happy for him, and I think it's great. I'm happy for the ECHL. Um, I, I'm, I'm just going to tell you this right now. When when you retire, I'm when you're like 70. <laughs> I'm going to ha- call you and say you have to host a uh, radio I'm, show tomorrow. I, I, I well, <laughs> first of all. Um, nobody retires. You get retired. Yes. That, but so you should say when I get when retired, you get retired. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm going to call I'm you gonna... at 70 and say there's a 12 yeah. to two Eastern radio show tomorrow that needs hosting. Do you yeah. want to come in? And I'll say, I haven't watched a hockey game in 30 years. Yeah. You know, and, and, and I'll just say it doesn't matter. You'll have to talk about elephant uh, poop from 1975 and you'll get through it. Listen, man, I, I don't take any of it for granted. Like, I know that it's a blessing that I get to do a show like this with you and talk about elephant poop from 1975. And there's context for it. 
And there's a story that comes along with it, and I love it. Um, that would make me very happy if he called me up at 70 and I still had my faculties and could cobble together a two-hour radio show. So thank you for that, Elliot. Uh, on that, we'll pause. We'll come back with the Montana's Thought Line. Congratulations, TR. Come back with the Montana's Thought Line and also Elliot's one-on-one with Nathan McKinnon of the Colorado Avalanche. Listen to the 32 Thoughts podcast ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Okay, welcome back to the podcast. Don't forget, still to come, Elliot Friedman's one-on-one sit-down with Nathan McKinnon of the Colorado Avalanche. Uh, That recorded Friday uh, in advance of Colorado's victory over the Toronto Maple Leafs Saturday on Hockey Night in Canada. Time now for the Montana's Thought Line, Montana's Barbecue and Bar, Canada's home for barbecue. Elliot. Try the ribs. Man, what a pause. 32 thoughts at sportsnet.ca. 32 thoughts at I'm going to try different tones I'm gonna, I'm gonna, and different cadences. I'm going to be like Peyton Manning at the line. <laughs> I've got to mix this up. I really think you're over a little you're bit. Overthinking this one. But we sold you on. Omaha. Omaha. <laughs> try the ribs. Try the ribs. Omaha. You got to put the accent on the right syllable. That's the key to all of this, Elliot. 32 thoughts <laughs> at sportsnet.ca. 1-833-311-3232. 32 thoughts at sportsnet.ca. 1-833-311-3232. Kevin. Oh, be- be- before we get to Kevin in the next one, yes. I wanted to tell you I got a note from someone. We were talking about the goalie Gordie Howe hat trick or the goalie oh, yeah, Hextall yeah, yeah. hat trick, yeah. whatever we were going to call it. Yeah. So someone reached out to me, one of the great people in the league, and I'm not going to say what his name is because... I think some of these people get paranoid that they're ever linked to oh, me. Oh, I know. W- one of the great people in the league reached out to me and told me about Mike Smith. Oh, yeah. Now, Mike Smith, in his first game in the ECHL, this person thought he scored, got a shutout, and got into a fight. And not only would this have been a legendary performance, it was not exactly correct, but it was close. So Mike Smith played in the ECHL for the Lexington Men of War. That was a one-year team. They played in Lexington, Kentucky, and they were named because you know Kentucky is obviously a big horse racing yeah. area. Yeah. Kentucky Derby. It was named after one of the world's most famous horses, Man of War. So it was called the Lexington Men of War, and I believe it was Smith's first game there. He had a shutout and he scored. And it was a one nothing game when he scored. I think the final score was 2 nothing. Like, you can find quotes of him saying, yeah, I know I maybe shouldn't have shot it, but look, we know Mike Smith now, 20 years later, oh, he yeah, was going to shoot it. Totally. He did not get into a fight in that game, but he got into a fight, I think, about two weeks later. So basically, Mike Smith, almost his first week as a pro, he, he, he completed the Gordie Howe hat trick in – like five games. Not bad. It's hard. It's, it's very, rare. It's there's close. A, there's a, there's, like it's close. There's a lot of really rare things that are in the, in the goalie Gordy there. Um, first of all, the goal, absolutely. And the fight, which happens seldom. Now here's the thing. Do you get special marks for fighting a player or does it have to be another goalie? I thought about that. No, after the you, podcast. Just, you just fight. Fight anybody? You just fight. Like a fan yeah, or an official? Fight. Like, doesn't matter. Like, you just grab a random fan and, like, that's Don't it. be too picky, Jeff. Oh, okay. Like, you know what? Like, some people can't afford to be picky and you're one of them. <laughs> so don't be too picky. <laughs> My, uh, Mike Smith always amazed me because he would go on these stretches where he was the best goalie in the world. Like, did it be like these one month stretches where he was invincible? Like he always had one of the one of the more interesting careers to me, and was well one a great puck handler too, you know. Like I said, like at times, like just the best goalie on the planet. You know, I was talking to somebody about Mike Smith this week, and they said to me, "I first of all, I think the Oilers really miss his competitive yes. nature." Yes, like that. That was the thing that people used to love about Mike Smith was how competitive that he was, and he drove players with him. Like he on a team, he was a driver. But the one, the one thing, the funniest thing that someone said to me about Mike Smith was, you know how you say on the podcast to me, you know, sometimes your your best characteristic is your worst characteristic? Sure. And I said, yes. And he goes, that's Mike Smith. Because Mike hmm. Smith believed he could do anything. And there were times as a coach or a teammate of his, 
you would say, Mike, you can't do that. Don't <laughs> even try it. And and they would say that some of the biggest mistakes that he would make or some of the ugliest goals that he would give up were be, were because he could, thought he could do yeah. anything and it would get himself into trouble. But more often you would take it over not taking it. But I really appreciated hmm. this person reaching out and I wanted to mention it and we should track yeah. down Mike Smith. I bet you that would be a hell of an interview. Thanks for the text, Gary. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> I gotta tell you, I'm not I've heard I'm not in his good books right now. Okay, let's get to Kevin in Massachusetts. Um uh, that's <laughs> I'm gonna hear about that one, Merrick. Thanks a lot. Kevin in jerk. Massachusetts. Elliot and Jeff. Statistically, I believe the majority of emails come in with Jeff's name first, so I'm sure he appreciates that. All right, Elliot and Jeff. Mm -hmm. The NHL All-Star Game skills puts power on display with the hardest slap shot. The game today has so many players with an unbelievable wrist shot. Have they ever considered a hardest wrist shot competition? Uh, nice job making them sound good, Dom. And shout out to number six, a beer league duty <laughs> we lost last year. All right, has there, have they ever considered a hardest wrist shot? Usually wrist shots are just used part of the, as part of the accuracy shooting. Yes, that, that's what I would agree. I, to be honest, I, I don't know like, I don't know if people would find that interesting. You I guys would, can all tell me if I I'm would. wrong. The hardcores would. The hardcores <sighs> would. Why, Dude, why am I fast, shocked fastest, this? Fastest backward okay. skater. How about fa hard, hardest backhand oh. shot competition? Like, come on, Elliot. We can, we, can, we can spice this up. Look, I know the slap shot isn't taken anymore but there is still some magic about who can really fire mm -hmm. that puck the the thing i do wonder about jeff is will we get to the point where nobody can even take a slap shot anymore i hope that never goes uh, away i don't think we'll ever get there although listen the gap is so tight now that it's really like you raise your stick up off the ice a second and yoink like that's it that uh, that scooby snack is gone um and I was going to say, you know what? You watched your Scooby Doo this morning because you did yoink and refused to refer to Scooby yeah. Snacks. You're going through full shaggy mode right Zoink, now. Scoob. By the way, if you were <laughs> if you were a Scooby character, you would be shaggy. Like that part was written for a little you. bit. I think there. I always think of uh, Scooby Doo that there are part. But the reason that it resonated so well with a lot of people and even into our adult years is I think a lot of people can see a little bit of every single character in themselves. This is for a different podcast at a different time when we really stretch for content. But I've thought about Scooby Doo a lot in my life, and I really do. One of the things I've come to is. We all see characteristics from our own personality in all of No, 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 no. We're doing this right no, now. We, no, we're hang taking on, a hang time on. No, no, out. Hang on yes. a second. No. We are taking a time out and we're talking about Scooby Doo. Why do you think about this? So well, much? first of all, it was one of. It's, there is no way I'm not asking you this okay. right here. Um, let me just get a list here of all the Scooby Doo characters. So. No, okay. Can, can you make it like reasonably quick though the, the only reasonably quick way that i can that i can make it is scooby-doo is sort of always presented as a star of of this one but i always it's funny you mentioned shaggy because you know the main reason that i always resonated with shaggy as a character one because i thought he was hilarious um two mm -hmm. characters like that in movies and there was a great one in pulp fiction um always caught my caught my attention mm. and three you know who had the voice of shaggy in Scooby Doo, was someone that I like. Casey, no, Casey. who? Oh, really? I yeah, never knew that. That was the voice of Shaggy. And I remember always watching Casey Kasem every week. This was on Saturdays. It is now time for <laughs> this week's long distance dedication. Yes. Did you love Casey Kasem? Like we all did. Casey, 20 years ago, I met a guy named Dom <laughs> whose picture on his iPhone was of him canoeing. Yeah. We met one weekend in Tofino, <laughs> and unfortunately, we could never see each other again. But I think about Dom all the time. Can you please play We Built This City by Jefferson Starship in honor of my friend Can you please Dom? play? I, 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 I love always Casey like to sort of... Sorry, I, you know what? I'm ruining this. No, 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 no. It's funny. One, one side note on Casey Kasem as well. I always love the sort of the, the weird, bizarre turn. Like I was expecting that to be. Can you please play like Mr. Roboto by Styx? It just turns out to be like this long-winded way of trying to get your favorite song on, which may or may have anything or nothing to do with the person you just dedicated um, that to. No, but I was always drawn to Shaggy's voice because it was Casey Kasem. 
And that was one of the first examples of voice acting. And then later on, I learned all about Mel Blanc and, um, and all the wonderful voices that, uh, that he did. And then later on, fell in love with the story of Christopher Murney, who played Hanrahan in the movie Slapshot, who went on to be this wonderful hmm. voice actor. Uh, and it was actually um, the voice actor of uh, Chester the Cheetah in the Cheetos commercials as well. But Shaggy was mm. the first one that I was like, wait a minute, that's Casey Kasem? Like that top 40 guy that I watch after Solid Gold every Saturday <laughs> afternoon? Um, but were you not a huge fan of Scooby-Doo, Elliot, as a kid? Of, like, of did course. this not like of, of totally capture? And I would have gotten away with it if it wasn't for you meddling kids. Yeah. During my university years, there were some late night Daphne Velma arguments mm -hmm. that turned borderline violent, I have to say. Okay. We turn our attention now away from how do we get from the hardest wrist shot to Scooby Doo? Nonetheless, <laughs> there know. was. Uh, real quick, uh, hey Jeff Elliott and Dom. First, I want to thank you for helping me get through some of my work days. Having the pod to distract me definitely doesn't impact my productivity. Apologies, <laughs> apologies, employers all out there. I had a question about the fallout from the Cutter Go Chain Flyers situation. Do you sure. think this will at all deter teams from selecting players out of college now, or will we see the NHL revisit its rules around players getting drafted and out of NCAA? and allowing them to choose not to sign and hit free agency without any sort of extra compensation to the team. Thanks for keeping us entertained and keep up the good work. That comes from, there's actually, there's, there's no name attached to that one. So that comes from Mr. or Mrs. Anonymous. From parts unknown, exactly. weighing 237 pounds, the masked superstar. Uh, okay, Mr. Nice. or Mrs. X, if that is indeed your name. Uh, it's a good question, and, and I'm going to say no. And, and, and the reason I'm going to say no uh, is that, number one, if you draft a player where Goche got drafted from, which was sort of like the, the USHL college route, you keep their rights for four years. And I just don't think, and it's the same thing for Europeans. If you're drafted out of Europe, they keep your rights for four years. I just think that after four years, if you can't convince a player to play for you, um, then you know you're never going to convince a, a player to play for you. And I just don't see the NHLPA wanting anything that gives um, any teams more control over the rights of a player. So to me, four years is enough. If the player wants to go through the process and say, "I'm going to wait four years or whatever." Um, you know, that's, that's life. Now the Canadian hockey league rule, by the way, is two years. Um, but, uh, you, you know, so if you're, if you're still under draft age, you go back into the draft. If you're over age, you become an unrestricted free agent. So it doesn't usually happen as much with the CHL players, but in theory, they have even less time to wait, uh, than a player like Cutter Goche would. So I don't see that changing, uh, really. I'll tell you what I do think. And, you know, I, unfortunately, I couldn't write the full blog this week because there was a lot going on. But the one thing that someone told me was they can guarantee me this, that when the Cutter Goche thing broke and the reasons got out or the conversation around it got out, every single team in the league called their top prospects and said, how are you feeling? You know, what's going on here? He said there is not a single team in the league that didn't think, do we have to worry about this? Is there any one of our prospects who could be leaning this way? And, you know, the, one of the things that Lewis Gross said in our interview with him on Friday was talking about how uh, kids had changed and the parents. Well, he didn't say so much kids. He said the parents were tougher, but he also blamed the agents for going after younger kids. And... Uh, someone in the league said to me they were really surprised that he went there. They were really impressed that he went there, and but he also said that this is a reality that they all have to live with. It's not just the agents who live with that. It's the teams who live with that. And he said the big lesson with Cutter Goche was you really have to be on top of your players. And that, you know, Philly thought that they were doing the right thing here by giving Goche space. It turned out to be the wrong thing. So there will be teams now that are going to be even more on top of their prospects because they said, you know, Philly tried to give them room and they lost the player. They lost control of the situation. So I think that's probably going to be 
the big lesson. So now all these college kids are going to be like, oh, thanks, Cutter. Now I have to talk to my NHL team every single day. <laughs> they're at, I got, I've got every, the director of player development is really on every, my tush. Thanks, every Cutter. single game, I got to talk to someone from the team. Oh, thanks, Cutter. <laughs> um, let's get to a voicemail. Uh, Thomas in Columbus. Go ahead, Thomas. Well, hey, guys. I am a recent listener. And I am <clears throat> wondering your guys' thoughts. Is this the best league has ever been from a product- production and a talent standpoint? Like, I just watched four games that went into overtime. And I was wondering, is that some of the best hockey you guys have ever seen? Well, first of all, Thomas, welcome to the pod. We are always happy to hear that there are new listeners. Sometimes Jeff and I wonder why, but we are appreciative. A lot of um, bored people uh-huh. out there, Elliot. A lot of time on that. <laughs> I w- I w- the one thing I would completely agree with is that it is the most skilled the league has ever been. I, I do believe that. I-, I-, I strongly believe that. And I don't think that's an insult to the great players of the past. I, I just think the way the game is taught from a younger age um, with more emphasis on skill coaches and skill development have really changed what a lot of these players can Equipment do. and training. On that equipment one, Equipment and training. Equipment yeah, and, and the training. training. You're, you're right. You know, like, for example, it used to be that you got fat over the summer and you got in shape over training camp. Like, that doesn't exist a- anymore. So, yes, I, I, you're right, Jeff and Thomas. I do agree. I think where things have really changed for the better in the league, and we got away from it, like, don't forget in the 80s, and I don't know how old Thomas is, but, you know, you had 40 players a year getting 100 points. You had 20 players a year getting 50 goals. And unfortunately, we went away from that. But now I just think, Jeff, that there, there seems to be comebacks every night. Like we went through, in baseball, they used to call it the dead ball era. In hockey, we went through the dead puck era. And that was sort of in the late 90s and the early 21st century. Now we've got comebacks. Um, and I think the thing that really changed the, in the eyes of the league was, you know, the 2004 Stanley Cup final, there were no lead changes between Calgary and Tampa. And people realized that can't work. You know, you cannot have that. Then there was the lockout. And at the same time as the lockout, you know, they had the Shanahan summit that kind of changed the way the game was looked at. And I know people will always be mad at referees. They're always going to disagree with calls. But there's no question to me that the that the the ability for comebacks and the ability for skill is as great as it's ever been. Uh, Jeff, how do you feel? I feel the same way. Uh, I think it's a, a matter of sitting on the shoulders of the the generations that came before. Um, you know, I don't think we get to this place in hockey unless there are a those glorious athletes that that came before to to, to pave the way and set a standard, and two, um, both rule changes. Uh, quality of athlete. I know that we've talked plenty now about how specifically in the United States, elite, elite, elite athletes now for the first time on mass in the history of hockey are choosing hockey first before choosing football or track and field or basketball or baseball or, or whatever. Um, I think the uh, equipment technology is at a um, is at a place right now, which is the best that we've ever seen. I mean, even just think about even like 2000, I want to say like 2002 or 2003, when a lot of players started switching to composite sticks. And there really were only about a handful of guys that knew how to use them. Like it was, don't forget, like remember how many passes went off blades? Like you're used to a wooden stick and it's really easy to take a pass on a wooden stick. Like if you ever, you know, you go back and use a wooden stick, you, the first thing you notice is like, wow, taking passes is great. And it took a long time for players to learn how to use composite technology. And the technology itself improved to say nothing of what happened with skates and, and that technology. I think nutrition and training is a big one as well. Um, and, and I think the, 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 league was, the league has been allowed to breathe and grow even as... The population of hockey players expands. I'll tell you one of the things that I that I often think about. I think you and I have talked about this before. Not necessarily. I want to take this in a different direction. Is this the strongest the league has ever been? And I think hockey everywhere right now is better than it's ever been. Um, I th- I spend a lot of time thinking about. And again, this is no insult to those players at that time. You just this is just circumstance. This is just the nature of hockey. I always wonder about that era between 1967 and 1975 
where I, I still maintain the NHL was at its weakest. And it's just because of expansion. There was uh, the league doubled in 1967, right? And then in 1970, you went from 12 teams to 14 teams. You know, welcome the Vancouver Canucks. Welcome the Buffalo Sabres. Uh, and then two years after that, all of a sudden, we got the Islanders. Welcome. We got the Atlanta Flames. Welcome. Like, you went through a really fast period of mass expansion, which watered down the NHL. And because of that, we saw a lot of videos of, you know, the high-end guys of the time skating around pylons with Minnesota North Stars jerseys on or Detroit Red Wings jerseys on, you know, two of the, the weaker teams of the era. Uh, again, no knock necessarily on all those elite players who played in that era, but I think of two things. One, when has the game been the strongest? And two, when has that game, when has the game been the weakest? And I'll always point to that time between 67 and 75. That's the time where the, there was just this massive, and to say nothing of the fact that, the, the, throw this one in the equation too, the World Hockey Association took a lot of good players from the NHL as well, further weakening that product and giving you know, the NHL um, headache after headache. Anyway, uh, long-winded answer here from me, but Thomas and Columbus, thanks so much. I would also say this. I think that's all great stuff. I think I would also say this. For a long time in recent memory, the goalies were ahead of the shooters. Now I think the shooters are ahead of the goalies. The goalies have not learned and well enough yet that if you give a shooter an inch, yeah. they will put well, it in Well, there was a long time too. Let's not forget. I mean, we're both kids of the 80s, and that was advantage shooter. I mean, it took a long time for goalies to catch up to shooters, and then when they did coupled with, you know, defensive schemes and, you know, looking the other way on interference and hooking and holding and all these other types of infractions, it became advantage goaltender. But I think you're bang on. And what's the uh, the uh, Elaine Vigneault line about making nets bigger? And Elaine Vigneault said, oh, if you want to score more goals, go work on scoring goals in the offseason because goaltenders work on becoming better goaltenders. Go work on your shot. You know what I got to tell you? You know what we're missing in hockey? We have to bring this back somewhere and we've really gone down the rabbit hole here good luck with this nine hour podcast Tom. uh but we've really gone down the rabbit hole here but we are missing and i know you watched this when you were a kid because i watched this when i was a kid is oh, showdown yes and, and they used to film that in the off season and mark ontario yeah and and you'd have you'd have the you'd have the scrimmage and you'd have the drills and it would be a scoring system it would be one goalie paired with two or three teammates, um, you know, the shooting drills, all that stuff. And they would film it in the summer and then they would show 30 minutes of it before a hockey night in Canada on Saturday nights. There were episodes so until one team one. It was so good. Like, you know, and, and I remember years ago when John Shannon produced hockey night in Canada, one thing he did in the off season once was called the Labatt blue pickup mm -hmm. cup. Uh, which Alan McCauley's team won, if I remember correctly. And I, I love this stuff. And when I was working at the score, we had one year, we got the rights to the CFL quarterback challenge where the quarterbacks in the CFL did a competition of drills and our viewers loved it. It was so good that TSN stole it from us, those thieves. <laughs> That's why I called them the evil telecom. Because they stole the CFL quarterback challenge from us. But I, I wish there was some sort of short off-season competition. Because the, the, uh, the players deserve their off-season time. But I wish there was some sort of short off-season competition that you could package and air later. Like showdown a showdown was awesome. competition. Showdown was great. Or like a pickup competition. I think people would love that. I think they would eat it up. So, I mean, look... Players deserve their time in the summer. The season's long, but if there was a way to do this, I think it would be awesome. Do you remember when Daryl Sittler had to compete in Showdown without a Maple Leafs jersey? Well, that basically got him traded, right? Him and Paul Mateer. That That's what started the fight with Harold Ballard and Punch Imlac. That Harold was feuding with them and didn't want the Maple Leafs logo attached to them? Yeah, so I, I, yeah, it was. I remember that was that was a that was big huge story. Story, at the time. Yeah. yes. Okay, <clears throat> let's get back to the regularly scheduled podcast here. Uh, let's get to uh, another voicemail. This is Josh in Saskatchewan. Hey guys, 
guys, it's Josh calling from the home of Mike Commodore, Fort Saskatchewan, Alberta. Uh, just listening to the pod here on the highway at a minus 46 night on the way to my 10 o'clock beer league game uh, because I'm a crazy Canadian. And it got me wondering if you guys had ever heard any funny stories about former NHL players playing beer league with the rest of us average Joes. Um, I guess if we win tonight, Jeff, that'll be for you. If we lose, Elliot, it's your fault. <laughs> guys, keep up the good work. Okay, I thought I was... First of all, that doesn't make you crazy. Yeah. That makes you perfectly normal in this great country of ours, that you would brave minus 46 to go to beer league. I see... Absolutely nothing wrong with that. Nothing. So uh, I announced uh, that it was Saskatchewan. It's Fort Saskatchewan, Alberta. Uh, apologies, apologies there. Uh, I got a good one. I love this one. I'm glad Josh called in on this one. So this is years ago. So uh, here in Stouffville, uh one of my best buddies is Sean Pearson. Sean Pearson is a former MMA fighter. He has yes. six fights in the UFC in the welterweight division. Uh, our kids play hockey. Great dude, whole deal. I've known Pierce for a number of years. Um, I've worked out with him. He's sparred with me. I have never either taken him down or landed a punch. It's just like you realize really quickly, Elliot, just when you think you can handle yourself, there's a whole different world out there, Elliot, of people that do it uh, professionally. Anyway, Pierce and I have been buddies for years. So Pearson told me this great story. He was playing... I want to say it was in Whitby. For people that don't know where Whitby is, it's a little bit east of the city of Toronto. So he was playing on a team, and this would have been a summer team, and Sean Thornton was on his team as well. And this happens a lot. I've seen this happen to Pearson before, even in like baseball, I think, or like the summer, summer ball. Guys, for whatever reason, want to go after the UFC fighter, you know, the former MMA guy, like, ha, 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 like, watch this. And he said, he said, you know, a couple of guys, you know, would take runs at him. And he said, one guy, I don't know if he caught him behind or Sean didn't see him coming. But Pearson said that he got smashed by this one guy, like right up against the glass. Thornton happened to be on the ice, grabbed him and like filled him up. Like, you know, that's a ridiculous guy. So Pearson tells me afterwards, he's, uh, they're in the, they're in the, in the dressing room <laughs> Pearson goes up to Thornton and says, Hey, you know, thanks for that. I really appreciate it. But, you know, I can, I can kind of handle myself. And Thornton stops him and says, No, 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 no. That happened on the ice. And on the ice, that's my fight. Now we're going to the bar. If it happens there, it's your fight. <laughs> <laughs> so that is my favorite NHLer beer league story with a, with a UFC tie in. So, thought you might like that one the, I'll, I'll give you one I, I remember some friends of mine uh who work in uh the financial business organized a game against some NHL alumni this is probably about 15 years ago and uh the alumni told me later that uh the dressing rooms were next to each other and when they got the list of alumni who were going to play they realized a lot of them were in their like late 40s um, there were a bunch of older guys who at that time could only be available for that game. So when they got the list of who was going to play, the, the financial guy said, you know, we could beat these guys. They're in their 40s. We could <laughs> say we beat these guys. So they got a young team. They got a younger team. And there were a couple of older guys. Like, So I would have probably been about 35, 30, 40 at the time. So there were a couple of guys my age, but they went and they got some younger players. And they're like, and they're in the room, like, and they're talking to each other, like, guys, like, these guys are in their late 40s. We're, we're going to beat them. Like, if you're not here to win, like, go home right now. And what they didn't realize is the alumni could hear them. And so they told me that it went from this is going to be a fun game to we're, okay, this is the way these guys are talking. We're going to teach them a lesson. And oh, that's awesome. I, I, I couldn't go, but my buddy told me later, he said that they never touched the puck. Oh, yeah. Like, you know, like they said that like, we were faster than them. Uh, we were we were younger than them. But when they decided that they were keeping the puck away from us, there yeah. was nothing we could do. Nothing. And I, I think I, I can't remember. I think they actually did score, but they almost got shut out. 
and nobody gets shut out in those games. Yeah. He's the, and then at the end of the game, one of the alumni told them, we heard what you guys were saying about us. And, you know, like what the guy said was, if you ever play these games again, remember it's supposed to be fun and don't ever underestimate the pride of someone who played in the NHL. And actually, my friend told me that a couple of the alumni told them that there are alumni who won't play in these games because of people like them. Because mm. like they're supposed, they want to, they want to have a good time. They want to have a couple beers. They just want to enjoy themselves. And you get people who think like, this is my chance to prove I should have been in the NHL. Yeah. So they got embarrassed. Like they just like they said. I think they lost like eight one or eight nothing or something like that. And they just said like, we never. They were all exhausted after the game. They couldn't move. They they had spent the whole game chasing. Mm. And that's the one thing I would always say is that. Maybe some of these guys are a little bit older. Maybe some of them have let themselves go. But you never forget how to play. And there's a big difference between a person who plays one, as little as one game in the NHL and somebody who thinks they're the best beer league player ever. I'll tell you what. I played in a charity game on a line. And I, I felt, I'll be honest with you, Elliot, I felt like Paul Henderson. I'll tell you why. I remember playing in a charity game on a line with Norm Ullman and Ron Ellis. And in the early was 70s... Was Norm Ullman using the two-sided stick? The two-sided stick? What's the two-sided Norm Ullman stick? Well, it's because Norm Ullman used to show up at charity games, and he had a stick that had a right blade and a left blade, and he would turn it over. No way. No, he wasn't using yeah, that I one. Yeah, saw, I saw it once. It was it was hilarious. That's awesome. But he could shoot both ways. That was the line in the early 70s. Uh, Henderson, Ellis, and Ullman... And I remember thinking to myself, like, okay, we're going to take it easy, like, you know, a little bit older to be generous, both very, very much older. And honestly, every pass was like hard and on the tape in motion. Like, you're right. Like, they may be a little bit of a step slower, but they can still think the game and move the puck. And this was incredible. I'm like, holy smokes, this was the line. Allman, Ellis, and Henderson. And I'm in the Henderson role, and all I'm doing is throwing passes in Norm Allman's skates. I'm throwing passes, like, way ahead of Ronnie Ellis. I'm like, geez, guys, I'm really sorry. I had to apologize, like, after every single shift because I couldn't keep up with them. You're right. Like, it doesn't matter how old you are. These guys remember, and these guys were NHLers. That's the Montana Thought Line. Montana's Barbecue and Bar, Canada's home for barbecue. Elliot's one-on-one -on -one with Nathan McKinnon is next. All right, welcome back to the podcast. Nathan McKinnon, leader of the Colorado Avalanche, uh, one of the favorites for the Hart Trophy, uh, had a chance to sit down with Elliot Friedman on Friday, one day in advance of the Avalanche game against the Maple Leafs on Hockey Night in Canada. So here it is, Elliot Friedman in conversation with the most serious player in the NHL. John the Taves isn't playing anymore. Nathan McKinnon on 32 Thoughts, the podcast. First thing I wanted to ask you, big news the other day, Landeskog on the ice. How good was it to see him? It's great. Um, even just around the room, um, you know, he's still rehabbing, obviously, but just to have his presence back in the room, you know, he's in our team meetings now. He'll come to the odd power play meeting uh, with our unit. Just hearing his input is, is so valuable, you know, um, just having that voice back. There's, there's not many, as you, you know, it's my 11th season now, and there's not many players that have a big presence in the room a lot of guys are in and out or they're new or you know he's been there since day one and has such a big presence as a captain for a reason obviously and uh, it's great to have him back do you th game one playoffs is he going to be there I'm, I'm praying he is yeah <laughs> he's doing all the right things and he looks great um you know I don't want to it's just hard I don't want to yep. put something out there but we're all very hopeful and uh He's an irreplaceable player in person, so we're all praying he's back. How much did you keep in touch with him when he was away? All the time. Yeah, we talk a lot. Um, yeah, we're just friends at the end of the day. We're, we're very close, and every year I feel like we've gotten closer and closer. And, um, you know, a lot of us miss him, myself included, And but we definitely uh, stay in contact. It's just hard, though. I don't want to ask him how he's feeling every day. Right. 
you know, it's more about how's your wife, kids, things like that. What are you doing? Whatever. Um, Nate, what the heck were you thinking on that play last night? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Definitely said some of that for sure. <laughs> um, this year, you know, you've got a point in every home game. Uh, you're on an absolute tear. Would you say that this has been your best season so far? Um, it's hard to say. I had I didn't have a great start to this season. Um, for whatever reason, I was just wasn't playing that well, and then at the 10, 10 11 game mark, something kind of clicked for me, and um, been feeling good lately. Um, you know, I think at the beginning of seasons, you want to you're, you're excited, you want to press hard, and you want everything to come so quickly. And um, yeah, I just had to try to relax a little bit, and uh, you know, fall back into how I play well. And um, you know, last year was was a solid year, and this year has been good so far, but. We're at the halfway point, so who cares? Haven't accomplished anything yet. No, sure haven't. The one thing you have done, the point every home game, and I know you care about bigger things than that, but there's only one guy who's kind of done that before, and it's Gretzky. And I know how competitive you are, and I know how much you care about the game. And I wonder if any part of you says, I would like to do that just to say, I did something that he was able to do. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, I mean, I like to get a point in every game every year, but it's it's going to come to an end. I, I know it will. Um, I've gotten very fortunate. You know, last game I had a second apple off a end board shot. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, Miko made a great play to Val in front of the net through his legs, and I get a point. So, it, you know, it's hard, it's hard to... Uh, you know, base happiness or uh, fulfillment off of a second assist or a point streak or whatever. Um, definitely striving to look at a bigger picture than, than that. But um, whenever you're mentioned with Wayne Gretzky, obviously it's cool, but it's still a home point streak. It's like, I don't know. I don't think it deserves to be with Wayne. <laughs> you know, it, it's funny you say this because I was making calls the last couple of days knowing to do this. And I said, has he, has Nate McKinnon changed, Nathan McKinnon changed at all since the, since you won the Stanley Cup? And everybody said, you would think that maybe he would relax a little bit or be satisfied a little bit. And it's not happened at all. If anything, it has made you hungrier. It has made you more determined to be as successful as you can be and for the avalanche to be as successful as they can be. True? Yeah, definitely. I think a little wiser maybe, though. Um, the the passion is there. It's been there my whole life. I don't think it's going anywhere, uh, whether you know hockey or post-hockey, who knows. But I think I learned a lot from that cup run, and I learned a lot from the failures before that. And I'm trying to shape myself into the best leader I can be for the team and um, trying to push guys the right way. Um, and I definitely think I've learned a lot um, of how to do that. And when we won, we had, you know, it's we went 16 and four. Um, you know, felt like a lot of rough patches though, and uh, a lot of uh, things to overcome. And with the group we had, I learned a lot from you know, guy like Cogliano, Landy. Mm-hmm. I, those are two guys I've learned probably the most from in my career, and that are honest with me, and I'm honest with them, and. Um, the fire's there, uh, that's for sure. It's burning as, uh, as much as ever, but definitely trying to shape myself, uh, and to be a, a good leader. One of the things that someone said to me was kind of like that, that you learned about what happened that year and what worked that year, as opposed to what didn't happen in other years. And you're kind of alluding to that there. So what did you learn about what it takes to win and what a good team does? Yeah, I think, well, in this I watched it after we won, but in Ted Lasso, when he talks about being a goldfish, I know Mm. that kind of went viral. Um, I think it's easy to try to break down every single game and every play, and but sometimes you have a bad night and everyone has bad days, um, and just flush down the toilet and move on. And um, with that, I think comes more resilience. Um, You know, you let things go more, and that's what I'm trying to do personally. And I think the the whole team is just 
you know, we lost seven nothing to Vegas this year. We, you know, bad night, moved on, and we went on another streak. So mm -hmm. um, I just think in that run, though, especially we, you know, losing to Tampa at home to win the cup was was gut wrenching, and um, we had to move on. We had 48 hours to to. Uh, you know, I don't think we even watched video on that game. I don't remember anything about it, and <laughs> we won game six. So I, I guess uh, just trying to have a short memory. So three years ago, you lose 7 nothing to Vegas. What's Nathan McKinnon like? <laughs> that's an ugly human. Yeah, that's an ugly human. Uh, hopefully, yeah, I'm glad, I, I'm glad we didn't three years ago. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I wanted to ask you a little bit about like, the, that. Ve those Vegas games, like, you guys played great the other night, but that exhibition game this year, I have never seen an exhibition game like that. Do you guys and them hate each other more than any two teams in the NHL right now? Uh, I don't hate them. Um, and I respect, I respect them, honestly. I, uh, I think they're an awesome team. They beat us in a playoff series a couple years ago. Um, and then they won the cup a couple years later. Um, I know Jack Eichel a little bit. And I respect his game. I think he's a good, good person. Uh, works really hard. So. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, it's, there's a big rivalry there for sure. Um, if we, uh, want to, uh, get to the finals, I think we're going to have to go through Vegas, which is not going to be easy. Um, but you know, we're up for the challenge. You're playing more than any other forward in the NHL this year. Can you handle that all year? Yeah. Yeah, I can. Uh, that's my job. And, you know, I try to get myself uh, mind and body ready for every game. One of the things I've heard is that you've worked a lot on, I guess, the the physical nature of your skating or the training nature of your skating. Are there things that you have done to work on to sort of improve your stride and, and improve your power, which a lot of people don't necessarily think needs to be improved, but mm -hmm. I know the best players are always working on that. Yeah, I think efficiency is something I'm, o I'm always trying to work on, um, you know, to play 22 to 20. 627 a night you, you need to be efficient you can't burn out quickly so um you know always working on that andy o'brien's uh, my strength coach and um break some break some things down every year uh and a lot of it's you know single leg strength um you know as, a, as skating we're always on one leg so trying to be uh, equally strong everyone's got a dominant leg and little things like that uh nothing crazy but um you know, every, every year trying to get better. I always wonder about those summer battles with, with, with Sid and the other players from Nova Scotia. And it was funny. I was talking to Ryan Graves and he said, what an honor it was when he got included <laughs> <laughs> because players say that they know they've made it when Nathan McKinnon and Sidney Crosby say, uh, that you can join our skates. What are those skates like? Yeah, don't forget about Marshy either. He's no, there. right, of yeah. course, yes, <laughs> yes. Um, they're they're awesome. They're so much fun. Um, you know, we you know from being from a small area, we actually have a lot of very talented players. Mm -hmm. A lot of NHLers now coming from Nova Scotia, which I think um, you know Sid and, and Marshy kind of paved the way for all of us. And uh, when I see younger guys coming up, I feel proud as well. Um, hoping to have played a small role in that. Um, you know, because growing up, I'd play in Ontario, and the Ontario kids would have no idea where Nova Scotia was. I'm like, it's not we're that not that smart in Ontario. <laughs> Everyone thought I was a fisherman and things like that. So I think we always had a chip on our shoulder. Um, so, but they're fun. They're competitive, and um, yeah, a couple a couple times a summer, there's some heated arguments, but usually we're okay. That's where I was trying to get to because the those players said, well, first of all, the one thing they all said was that you guys are very inclusive. Like sometimes you go in with the veterans and you're worried how the veterans are going to treat guys. But they say the three of you are fantastic. But the other thing they say is you are the one that never takes a day off in terms of this better be a good skate. Like no screwing around. This better be a good skate. Is that true? Yeah, I think. Sid, Sid's the same way. I'm a little more vocal maybe than him, but um, he's the same. And, you know, we're, we're just – our careers are short, and I think in the summers we only skate two, three times a week, and we just want to make them the best as we can. And it's it's fun, though. Everyone that comes out knows they, they got to be ready to go. And, uh, yeah, it's not uh, 
it's not a leisurely skate. Cogliano came down a few years ago, and he loved it too. And mm-hmm. It's just fun. It's it's a it's a fun environment to work hard in. Are you and Sid always on separate teams? Yes. Yeah. Always. Always. Yeah. He's I'm I'm in a blue. He's in a black every summer. Um, Marshy and Sid are on the same team. Always. Always. Yeah. Uh, that's tough to handle. <laughs> that's tough. I don't win many games, but uh, it's fun. Is there anybody you're always with? Um, I'm usually with Drake Batherson mm-hmm. and um, Logan Shaw mm-hmm. and uh, Sean O'Donnell. Are, we've been skating together for 10 years mm-hmm. now. So those are the, the three guys I'm usually with. What is the biggest fight you've got or battle you've had with Sid in one of these games? <laughs> no, nothing physical. Just okay. That was nothing wondering. physical. Just... Um, usually if a goal counts or not and our, and our summer coach, uh, has to be the one to decide. And, uh, it's, it's funny. It's really funny. Um, but yeah, poor guy. I feel bad for him. He has to, he has to pick if, if I'm right or Sid's right. And, okay. Here's the toughest question I can ask you about Crosby. And that's the last one. Will you guys ever play together? I hope so. Um, I'm hoping, um, I don't know what's before, uh, the 26 Olympics, mm-hmm. but there might be something, but next year, next year. Mm-hmm. But I guess the main thing I'm focused on is the Olympics. And yep. that's what would be amazing. Um, I think Sid has a ton of game left. I think he can play as long as he wants to, honestly. Um, I'm a believer that primes are a little longer now. And mm. if you do the right things, look at a guy like him, Pavelski. There's lots of examples of guys that are very successful in their thirties. And I think Sid's going to be, a great player uh, two, three years from now. So hopefully uh, I can stay good enough to make that team and uh, play together. I think your position is pretty safe. (laughs) I remember a couple of years ago you skated with Marner, right? Because you wanted to get used to, just in case it ever happened, you and Marner would play together on an Olympic team or a World Cup team. Is there anybody else you skated with just in case like that? Um, Over the years, I think just through the World Championships, I've, you know, played with Braden Point. Um, I played on a line with Marnes, um, power play mm-hmm. at the 2017 World Championships, which was a ton of fun. Um, yeah, Sid played with Connor, the North American team. So um, familiar with a lot of guys. And I'm sure the summer of 25, maybe we'll do some more camps, things like that to, to get ready for it. I can tell you, you want this. I know there's a lot of players who've been very vocal behind the scenes that it's time. And you're one of those guys, aren't you? Yeah, I think so. I mean, um, I missed uh, three Olympics now. I guess at 18, I wouldn't have made it, but 22 and 26, I would have had a a good chance. So, um, yeah, I I would like to. I mean, if if not the next one, then when, I guess. So I might be done if I don't get (laughs) to the next one. I'd love to play in one. I know Connor really wants to play in one and um, hopefully win. And I think it's just such a special thing that I grew up watching and, you know, winning the the Stanley Cup is one thing, but, you know, representing and competing for Canada is a whole nother thing um, that can really solidify your career and look back on and be uh, something super proud of. Okay, I wanted to ask you, did they they asked McDavid a lot about the All-Star game. Did they ask you about it at all? No, nothing. <laughs> no, they didn't? They probably didn't think I was going to make it or something. So <laughs> happy to be here. Well, you know, was, I'm sure it was really close. I'm sure <laughs> it was really tight. But now there's this competition, right? Yeah. Have they talked to you about that? Uh, no, my agent, Pat, said I'm... That's if, Pat Persson. Pat Persson. He said um, that they want me to be in it, so... I'm going to be in it. I have no idea what I'm going to be doing, but you're going to do all the events. I think. Yeah. I don't know what the events are, but I'll be ready to go. You know, it's hard as shot. It's Oh, okay. It's Oof. no, but there's all, there's the skating competition. So how, how do they do it? Do they like put everything together and then, you know, how, well, it's one event after the other. Okay. And it, it, I don't know what the order is, but it's, it's skill stuff. They're going back to the hardcore. It's things like hardest shot. It's okay. things like the fastest skater. There's, puck handling drills and things like okay. that and they want you know the top guys playing they want you they want mckinnon they want matthews i mean bedard would have been there but he's hurt now so we'll yep. see so I, I mean i really am interested in this like the best players going head to head to head what do you think of it i think it'll be much better um 
even just family and friends that go to the skills competitions, I lose interest. And um, it, it sounds exciting. Like I said, I don't have any say in it, but I'm willing to participate. And um, I'm not sure how good I'm going to do. <laughs> um, but um, I'll be happy to watch the other guys uh, do it as well. Now, who would be the, the person that you would enjoy beating the most? Beating? Yeah. Oh, I don't know. I might not beat anybody. So <laughs> I'll come 12. <laughs> I'm not, not last. It's called 12. So. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not wagering on that. I can, I can tell you that much, but you know, you are a big fan of hockey. So on nights where you're not playing, I know you watch, I know you keep an eye on the league. Who is the player that you love watching the most? Um, I think Sid, I watch a lot of Pittsburgh games. I, I watch, uh, Braden Chen as well. Just mm. two, two good friends of mine. Um, Tyson Berry in Nashville mm -hmm. um, and then you know I love watching Kucherov I think everyone does I think if you ask everybody's favorite player in the NHL I, I think they'd say Kucherov really I would say like all the you know top guys in the league whatever mm -hmm. you want to call it I think everyone uh, you know is a big fan of his um, obviously McDavid is McDavid. <laughs> I mm -hmm. don't know what to say about him. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think those, I like watching Pasternak and um, is a right-handed shot guy. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm a big fan of the game. I think there's such amazing talent right now in the NHL. I think uh, more maybe than there's ever been. Um, obviously, Connor Bedard coming up as well. Mm -hmm. Skate with him a little bit and uh, just marvel at what he can do. So definitely a, a big fan and it makes me want to get better myself just watching watching these guys play. What's the thing that you you think you're most better at than maybe when you started of all the things that you do? Uh, I think passing. Mm -hmm. um, I think um, trying to slow the game down a little bit out there. And that's why I like watching Kucherov so much because I'm probably the opposite player as him. <laughs> um, he's just has no pulse out there. It looks like when he's playing, it's amazing to watch. And um, I think that helps his vision. He sees everything. He's never in a panic. So, I think uh, for mm. me, trying to slow down just a hair. You know, Kucherov is, of all the players you mentioned, he's probably the one we know the least just because, you know, we you don't see him do long-form interviews or anything like that. Aside from the fact he slows the game down, you know, what else have you learned or noticed about him that maybe people wouldn't know? I'm no, I know nothing about him. Really? Uh, you see, none of <laughs> I, us do. Yeah, yeah. I, I played against him in junior, so I have that connection. But, um, yeah, he's a mysterious guy, and I'm sure... He does that on purpose, but um, I've met him a few times. He seems like a really nice guy. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, just marvel at his game. Eighteen million over the cap, Nikita Kucherov. Yeah, that was great. Yeah, that was great. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to ask you about Jonathan Drouin, and I've told this story before. But when Jonathan Drouin uh, left Tampa for a while, uh, I came to do a game in Colorado, and you said, "Don't give up on that guy." He's a he's a good man. He's a good player, and he just needs an opportunity. And I know that this off season, when it came to, I know you've been very supportive of him behind the scenes. And when he became a free agent, I mean, everybody knows you played a big role uh, in getting him to Denver. And first of all, I just wanted to ask you, why was it so important for you to look out for Jonathan Drouin? Yeah, well, I think. First of all, I know he's a great person, and he's even better as a person than 10 years ago when we were in high school or whatever. But, um, you know, he's, uh, his talent is just – it's still there, and you, you can see this season. It's, he had a slow first 10 games, just getting comfortable, but now he's taken off, and he's looked awesome. And uh, we're playing together on a line, and he's earned it. He was getting healthy scratched and still had a smile on his face every day, and – um, but I guess in the off season, I, you know, I knew, you know, he took less money to, to come to us and which was great, but I just felt like, um, the value he would bring. Um, and you know, I just felt like there's so much more there. Um, you know, I don't know, I can't speak on Montreal, but I know in Denver, it's pretty good. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's you know, not a ton of pressure. Um, you know, he can kind of do his thing and fly under the radar. And um, he even talks about just going to the grocery store now or, you know, he's just a civilian living his life. And I think he really enjoys that. And um, he's, uh, he's playing really well right now. I understand you guys are always together. You go to practices together. You drive almost everywhere together. 
um, you've really taken a role in making sure he's comfortable. Uh, I'm just curious, like what kind of interest do you guys have in common and why was it so important to you to kind of be the big brother of Druan? Um, yeah, he's, uh, he, I guess I didn't really, I knew it, but he loves hockey. Like he watches every game. Uh, like he really loves the game and you know, we, we, we can just talk about anything. And I think when you have a friend, you know, from your childhood, pretty much, um, you just feel so comfortable with them and I feel very comfortable and you know we drive together a lot you know and on road dinners we go every time together um, you know we do a lot of the same workouts together we're, we're just together all the time in the gym and the after practice we're just on the same page with everything mm -hmm. um, which is awesome you know you don't find that a ton that friendship and um, so I'm grateful that we are teammates again and we've had a lot of fun this year. Do you guys play the credit card game together when you go out for dinner? A uh, little bit, yeah. Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes, yeah. <laughs> who's the big winner and who's the big loser? Um, I'd say I've lost more this year. So <laughs> trying to pick them up. Yeah. <laughs> he took uh, less to come. So I, gotta, I, gotta I understand. Some meals. I understand. I understand. <laughs> you talked about workouts. One of the stories that's pretty legendary about you is after games that you have a big workout after games. And uh, the joke is that the bus never leaves on time because Nate's working out, but no one's got a problem with that. What do you do after games? Um, I love to bike. Andy got me on that. The, yep. The, the zone two ride. Mm -hmm. Health uh, and fitness people will know that, the zone two. Um, it's like the subconscious of your nervous system. And um, yeah, just kind of get all the lactate out. And, um, you know, I think, Actually, the, you know, the Tour de France people, when they have a day off, they do like a six-hour zone two ride, mm -hmm. and then they ride the next day. Um, if they didn't do that, they wouldn't be able to move. So that's kind of where the idea came from. And mm -hmm. um, the more you play, the more biking that I do. So Okay, a, a few more. Number one, good stories I heard about you, golf. I heard there was a one point in time you were a terrible golfer, <laughs> and now you're a very good golfer. Is that true? Yes, and... Yeah, the temper was bad. I'm sure no one wanted to play golf with me. I was terrible. Uh, would get really frustrated and uh, put some effort into it. And I don't play as much anymore, but um, got decent. So what do you shoot now? I'm usually uh, high 70s, mid mid to low 80s mm -hmm. kind of thing. Um, I think I'm a five handicap. I heard you dropped like 20 strokes in a year or something like that. Yeah, I was in the hundreds and then... In a year? yeah. Yeah, and then I kind of play. You know, it's hard to get once you get to a four or five. It's hard to get better than that. You got to really put some time in, and maybe when I retire, I'll I'll start doing that. So how'd you do it? Did you buy did you, did you buy like a simulator or something like that? I took a lot of lessons in Denver. I I was from like twenty to twenty three. I was just like ten minutes from my our rink. Um, awesome guy. I would just go there for an hour after practice and just hit balls like every day. Um, and then I had to stop. My back was a little tight. I'm like, what am I doing? So uh, I don't do that anymore. In the summers, I like to play. But in the season, I don't really touch the clubs. So who was the best guy that you beat after years making fun of you for the way you played <laughs> or took money from you uh, or anything like that? Probably Tyson Barry. Yeah. Barry, he used eh? to give it to me. So, uh, yeah, he's the, worst, he's the worst one now. So Really, eh? Oh, yeah. The worst player or the worst no, needler? The, the, the worst golfer on uh, oh. Oh, yeah, on our little golf trips we do. So it's fun to beat him. Who's the best? Um, Braden Shen's really good. And me and him are probably pretty close. Okay. So the other one, the other funny story I heard is that nobody tells Nate, Nathan McKinnon what to do except his dog. <laughs> is that true? <laughs> I don't know who said that. But yeah, it's probably true. Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay. Tell us about this dog. Her name's Maggie. Um, she's like a small dog. She's right? like, yeah, 25, 30 pounds. And I never thought I could love a dog so much <laughs> before. So, uh, yeah, she's better than coming home to her is better than scoring any goals and uh, really enjoy it. What kind of dog is she? She's a Cavapoo. Okay. So they're pretty popular right now. Mm -hmm. 
uh, doesn't really shed that much, and mm-hmm. she's just she's great. Miss her already. <laughs> <laughs> That's what someone said to me. Why don't you have to bring it up, man? <laughs> nobody tells Nathan McKinnon what to do except he melts in front of this dog. I do. I do. It had to be Braden that said that. <laughs> I'm never giving up the source. Okay, you fair. know that. I'm never, I'm never giving up the source. Um, I want to ask you about Jokic. I understand there was a charity event on Thursday night that uh, the Avalanche do with the other members of Cronky Sports with the Nuggets and the soccer team and the lacrosse team. And you, I mean, we've seen the video before of you a little bit with Jokic. And I, and I know you went to a game in the finals last year. Do you guys have any kind of relationship at all? Not a super... I wouldn't say we have a relationship. I've I've met him a few times at uh, events like that. Um, I'll go to some Nugget games and um, see him there and say hi to him there. But um, I I know um, Caleb Jones' dad, Popeye. Seth, yep. Mm-hmm. Seth and Caleb's dad. Sorry, yes, yes uh, no worries. Pa- Popeye, yes. Popeye, Popeye, yeah, Popeye, yeah. Popeye Jones. So he was. I talked to him actually last night at the event, and uh, I'm just so interested in Joker. I think he's. An anomaly, yes. obviously, and he doesn't have social media. And I watched an interview he did with uh, Michael Porter Jr. He's got a podcast. Him and Joker did an interview, and mm-hmm. he says he doesn't want a phone when he retires, and he just lives like a low-profile kind of life. And um, you know, everyone just talks about how selfless he is. He's not worried about you know external awards, or uh, he just wants to win and have fun with his teammates. And um, I think he's an awesome guy to. Uh, look at as an athlete and try to emulate. See, I see all the work that you put in and I see that he, he jokes like he basically does nothing. And does it make you crazy that you're putting all this effort in and he doesn't look like he's even trying and he's a successful. Yeah. So but you hear things and that's actually not true at all Okay, uh, with him. I always thought that too. Um, but I guess he's an, he's an animal in the gym after games Mm. and He's actually looks super competitive. He's got suspended a couple times yes. for hitting people. Uh, have you seen his brothers? Yes. So I would not want to cross those. No, guys. like he he's a fiery guy, and uh, I think you know he's he's he just looks so funny, and you know, I guess they, people say he treats it like a nine to five and doesn't even like it. Um, but I hear I hear behind the scenes how hard he works and how much he loves to compete and win. So. Um, Maybe there's a little little bit to it uh, that I do, hopefully. <laughs> hopefully I'm not wasting my time. <laughs> no, no, you're not. Last one for you, uh, Nathan. If you could change one thing in the NHL or you could bring one thing that could happen in the NHL, what would it be? Ooh. I would love to see a team in uh, London. In London, England? Yeah. Really? I, would, I, I love Europe. Um, I don't logistically i don't think it could ever happen but you never know maybe one day um yeah i love to also play there um you know in, in the global series or whatever playing the o2 or something like that mm-hmm. i just think i think uh, british people would love hockey if they uh saw a little bit more of it and saw all of the best players play that's a great answer very unique thanks for your time yeah no problem thank you for having me Hope you enjoyed that. Nathan McKinnon of the Colorado Avalanche. We thank the Avs for making him available. Uh, Don't forget, this Thursday, we will be in Victoria as part of Scotiabank Hockey Day in Canada. And along with that celebration of the game, uh, we'll be doing a live podcast. Uh, We'll be recording it. It's Thursday in Victoria at Wicked Hall. Uh, We'll record it. Poor Dom. This is going to be like a million hours long, too. And uh, that'll be our Friday drop uh, for 32 Thoughts, the podcast. So, again, Thursday, uh, podcast recording live at Wicked Hall in Victoria. And you can hear all of it if you're not there Friday morning. Good luck, Dom. We'll talk to you again Friday.